everybody's here. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Geza Gyuk from uh, the Adler Planetarium. Um, he's going to be giving the Sigma Xi lecture, uh, this year's Sigma Xi lecture, this spring Sigma Xi lecture. He's been an astronomer at the uh, Adler for 16 years. He did his PhD before that uh, in, at the University of Chicago and then spent uh, two postdocs, one at UCS. Uh, particularly a, a space science uh, institute, primarily, and uh, a very nice place, a beautiful place to work. Uh, I spent a, a sabbatical there. It's a beautiful place. Um, uh, Gaze has had, have, has had a, an adjunct appointment at the University of Chicago. He has also supervised one of our recent PhD graduates, um, um, uh, Gail uh, <laughs> Ratliff, who just graduated last summer. She's doing quite well. So I will hand it over to you, Giza. Uh, thank you. It's working? Excellent. OK, so uh, before I begin, I would like to ask, who here has any background in astronomy or satellite design? Only you, Chris. Excellent. OK, I can say anything I want to. Good. Just always good to get a start. All right, so uh, today I'm going to be talking uh, and sort of the theme of this uh, research day, uh, talking about a sort of a slightly different way of uh, conducting research uh, that we're working at at the Adler Planetarium. As you know, the Adler Planetarium is an, an informal educational institution. It's not a formal one. We don't have classes. We don't have students as such who, uh, you know, come by the thousands to learn. We instead have hundreds of thousands of visitors every year, and they come and they dip in uh, maybe for an hour or a few hours, and it's completely free choice learning. It's an informal setting. And so we thought it would be very interesting to explore and see what sorts of informal uh, or citizen science sort of based ways of doing research there were. And so we've sort of had that in the back of our mind uh, for a long time, and we've sort of arrived at two ways of approaching uh, this problem of how to do research in an informal uh, setting where you don't have students uh, such. That's not to say that we don't have postdocs and the occasional students as well, uh, but we're also exploring this uh, new concept. Okay, so uh, citizen discovery uh, from green peas to night sat, and I'll explain what both of those things are uh, shortly, so it's not quite so cryptic. Uh, and as I'm from the Adler Planet here. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, the traditional model of doing uh, research is that you might be in an institution of one form or the other, uh, that it's centralized uh, and credentialed. Okay, the IIT is, is a beautiful example of this. You know, IIT has a reputation, it's, it's a legitimate place. Uh, research occurs sort of centered on the campus. Of course, you go other places to do it and stuff, but sort of the core and heart of uh, IIT is in, uh, in, this, in this location, okay? Uh, however, there's a sort of new model of doing uh, research where you can think that there's, there are people out there uh, the, you know, who could be helpful to you. The, the, all the minds aren't in one place. And you have this wonderful thing, you know, the, the internet, and in dramatic increases in uh, communication channels, dramatic increases in computational power, and many, many people around the world because there's so many people, even small fractions of them, uh, who have access to sophisticated tools. I mean, even your cell phone these days is an amazingly sophisticated piece of machinery compared to just 10 years ago. Uh, and there's beautiful examples of that, which I can tell you about later. So in this model of distributed research, instead of having students who are engaged in your research with you, so undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs in some sense are students still learning some of the ropes of how to do research from you. Instead, you have the crowd, where participants in this research can be anywhere. Uh, they can contribute at their own level. They're volunteers, they're students, they're teachers, they're retired geeks, there's current, currently employed geeks, uh, you know, like me. Uh, anybody who might be interested in the topic matter that you uh, are interested in. And I'll be talking mostly about uh, sort of astronomy and astrophysics-based ones, uh, topics. Uh, but there are many other, uh, we've done research in this mode ranging from uh, cancer biology to uh, ancient uh, hieroglyphics to uh, the 
network, uh, network, the social networks of uh, Huygens, I think it was. Okay, and so the organ organizing structure, instead of sort of a institution, uh, is is community. Is a community that you form. And I'll be talking, so to bring this much more concrete level, I'll be talking about two specific sort of case studies, case examples uh, of this, to, to, so you can see where I'm going. Uh, first is the Xenoverse, and we'll get to understand that in a moment, and which is focused primarily on data analysis and reduction, how the crowd, people in general, uh, the pub, general public can help you in your data analysis and uh, reduction. And then Far Horizons, which is a project that's based on uh, doing space exploration and engineering with di diverse groups. Okay, so part one. All right, so more, uh, overview. I'll talk about the origins of Galaxy Zoo, which is what led to eventually the universe, uh, the fundamentals, what's the imp what are the important lessons we learned from it, and then sort of continued directions. Okay, so the universe starts from two guys in a pub. That's where all good stories start. Uh, talking about a research project. And the research project, uh, so they were Chris Lintot and uh, Kevin Schwerinsky. Uh, and they were talking about Kevin's research project, which was to look at galaxies, uh, these assemblages of stars, so here's you know, a nice spiral galaxy here, and then, oh, I think this one is an elliptical, though it's hard, rather hard to tell. Uh, this is perhaps a better example. Uh, so sp spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, and generally speaking, spiral galaxies tend to have newer stars, which are bluer stars. And generally speaking, elliptical stars tend to have older stars, which are redder stars. But that's not always the case. And so if you want to look at a huge sample, you, know, you don't want to just look at one or two uh, galaxies. You don't want to look just 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 galaxies. You want to look at, say, 100,000 galaxies so you can really get into the statistics of it. Then you have to have some way of, if you want to look at, say, spiral galaxies, you have to figure out some way of getting a sample of spiral galaxies. Well, it turns out computers aren't very good at saying, this is a spiral galaxy. Now, you can use a proxy. You can say, well, galaxies are t uh, bluer galaxies are typically spirals, and therefore I'll look at blue galaxies. That's easy. You can just measure the color of a galaxy you know, spectroscopically or just photometrically. Uh, and then you can say, all right, these are my spirals. But it's not always going to be the case, especially if you're interested in the red spirals and the blue ellipticals. This isn't going to work very well. What you really need is a large sample of galaxies. So you take something like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a huge survey, which had millions of galaxies in it. And you say, all right, I'm going to start classifying them so that I can classify them with your eyes into spirals and ellipticals, and then once you have that, then you can do statistical analysis on the qualities of uh, the galaxies. And this was Kevin's uh, PhD project. And he had started and got to about 50,000 galaxies classified in a few months, and at that point he rebelled. And he was like, I can't take this anymore, you know, I'm going to go and become a chef or something like that, uh, which maybe would have been a great idea. Uh, but. So this is what, this is what led to the drink in the, in the pub uh, in Oxford, uh, you know, him saying, I can't take this anymore. And his advisor, Chris, said, look, okay, that's fine. Just calm down. You can take a break, take a, take a month's break. And in the meantime, you know, why don't we just put this up on, uh, on the web? You know, we'll just have something that serves up pictures of galaxies and says, is this spiral or elliptical? And maybe your colleagues, you know, can help you out. Just ask some of your grad student friends, you know, maybe there's some postdocs who'd like to do this. And, you know, we can keep the project moving even when you're taking a month or two off uh, from that. And so they did this. Uh, unfortunately, the, the word got out to the Oxford PR department, who said, oh, that's really cool. Chris and uh, Kevin were sort of, what do you mean? It's just not that exciting. But the PR folks thought it was exciting, and they put a press release out. And well, you probably know what happens next, is that it gets picked up by this, that, the other. And before you know it, all million galaxies had been, uh, had been uh, classified tens of times instead of just once. So something about this process of helping a scientific experiment do a simple task was very exciting and very interesting to people. And 
in just days. I mean, in fact, they broke their server a couple times and had to rebuild it uh, faster and better than before. Took, you know, an uncounted number of uh, galaxies, which they were just throwing their hands up, of, and got classifications. Uh, and so this is what it looked like. You know, pop up a galaxy. Here you've got uh, different, different choices. So you just sort of press your button. You know, is it a clockwise spiral, an anti-clockwise spiral? something, an edge on, or is it an elliptical galaxy? And then, you know, why not ask a couple other questions while you have it up there? Uh, so here's an example of, uh, that was an, oops, wrong direction. Uh, that was an example of a spiral, here's an elliptical, and voila, you get papers out. Okay? It's not quite so simple because you actually have to analyze. You can't just trust a single click. You have to say, how many clicks do you need to have? So how many people need to agree that you have a spiral galaxy there? It's very easy on these big galaxies. It's more difficult on smaller galaxies, which are more fuzzy, and then you know, maybe 70% uh, say it's spiral, and 30% say elliptical. But it turns out that if you have enough classifications, it gets quite robust. You actually don't have a whole lot of uh, uncertainty uh, in in what you have. And so this is uh, the sort of the, the results. They got a clean separation uh, between the, uh, the spirals and the ellipticals. Uh, in color space, it was even better in color magnitude space. And it was by far the largest uh, set of these sorts of classifications. So they thought, hey, you know, we're sort of onto something here. Uh, let's keep running the project and uh, keep getting, getting data. I mean, more statistics is always good. And they discovered something really interesting. By accident, they had chosen to put the name of the galaxy on the you know, web page. You know, galaxy reference number here, okay? I mean, don't, don't feel obliged to memorize that. It turns out that that was easy, and they just completely sort of coincidentally decided to link it to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey page on that galaxy, uh, which gives spectroscopic information and much more detail. They thought, eh, it's a throwaway thing. It doesn't hurt us, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't gain us anything. Well, it turns out it gained them a lot, because as the volunteers were forming a community, uh, they had an ability to talk to each other. There was a talk function uh, uh, that, was, that was linked in. They started talking, some of them got interested and said, well, you know, these are really interesting. And one of them posted saying, say, hey, give peas a chance. And he posted uh, a picture with a bunch of galaxies that he had found that looked like this. He said, he called them green peas, give peas a chance. You know, can anybody else tell me, well, they find interesting things like this as well. And the response was sort of overwhelming. Dozens of people jumped on and said, hey, yeah, I saw something just like that. I saw something just like that. And pretty soon, there were lots of these. And nobody quite, was quite sure what they were. But when they started looking at their spectra, because they had this ability to dig deeper, to go a little, just a little deeper, they found that they all had this very strong, and I'm not sure this is actually an example of one of them, but they had a very strong spectral line, an oxygen-3 line. And it turns out oxygen-3 is a tracer for star formation. Galaxies which are undergoing huge bursts of star formation where many, many, many stars are being formed. Maybe they're triggered by galaxies colliding or nuclear activity. They form, they have this very, very strong oxygen-3 line. And that changes the color that they, that they look at. The green colors, it turns out, is actually a mistake uh, in the color, uh, color rendition of, of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's, they don't actually look green to the eyes, but the name stuck since brown peas wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, so uh, from many, many examples, the next thing, of course, you do is write a paper uh, on it. And so uh, this is a discovery of a very specific class of star-forming galaxies, uh, compact, very high. So they're hundreds of times more active than our own galaxy. And this was only because they happened to put this link that allowed people to dig deeper, and it was completely a citizen science discovery. At this point, they realized, hey, wait a second, we're on to something. So this is when uh, the 
more or less when the, when the Adler, we actually got involved fairly early on the project, uh, got involved uh, with Oxford to, uh, to promote this idea. And we sort of boiled down the fundamentals of what do you want to do when you're trying to do a citizen science project along the lines of Zooniverse, where you're trying to ask many, many, many people to uh, help you with your data analysis. To, I mean, and we've done things as diverse as, for example, classifying galaxies or classifying uh, uh, particle interaction events, for example, uh, in, uh, in gamma ray showers in the upper atmosphere. That's actually not that diverse, but uh, the hell in physics. But, uh, so the important things is that you have to show that it's a real science need. We don't put anything up on the Zooniverse, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, that's not real science. If it's just sort of fake uh, make work stuff, it doesn't belong there. Uh, there has to be a real need for it. You can't, if you can do this with a computer, if you can do a classification of galaxies with a computer, then you shouldn't be wasting people's time. Okay? You should, uh, so there has to be a real need. And of course, you could say, well, I mean, it probably could do classification of spirals versus ellipticals. I mean, if after all, if you can classify faces, surely you can uh, classify galaxies. The trouble is that faces is a billion dollar industry. Galaxies, not so much. So, you know, Yes, eventually computers can catch up and classify ga galaxies, but it's not going to happen anytime soon, unless somebody knows something about the market that I don't. And then finally, you've got to have real results. You've got to actually eventually take the results and turn grind out papers. People aren't interested in just sort of classifying things for people and you sort of sit on the results. There's, there's no gratification in the end. So bottom line, uh, don't waste participants' time if you're interested in this mode of doing things. A few other important things. Uh, provide well-defined, simple well-defined tasks. It's not enough to sort of present a picture of a galaxy and say, tell me something interesting about this. Because most people will answer, it's a fuzzy dot or something like that. Uh, you've got to say, you know, is it spiral? Is it elliptical? Click here or here. Uh, you have to apply a rigorous analysis to clicks. So if you have a database which says, you know, for this galaxy, you've got so-and-so numbers of clicks saying that it's a uh, spiral galaxy and so-and-so number of classifications as an elliptical galaxy, then you could just say, you know, winner take, take all. But that's not necessarily going to work in all cases. It's, it's fairly robust, but not in all cases. Uh, there are biases that can creep in. For example, in deeper analysis, they realized that people tend to, if, if it's, for, uh, Glory, humans tend to uh, classify things as counterclockwise. So if you do a study where you take exactly the same images and you flip them, there's always a bias towards counterclockwise, despite the fact it's exactly the same uh, parity reversed images. Uh, so you have to, have to be a little bit subtle. It's not just, you know, winner takes all. Uh, allow the participants a chance to talk. That's what gets you serendipitous new discoveries, where people actually discover new things, completely new things. You've got to recognize the contributions that uh, people make. Uh, so Galaxy Zoo, uh, Zoo listed all the people who helped them. Uh, I, now, they didn't put all 100,000 people on their paper as authors, but they did refer to the list and said, go here to take a look. And they also, when people came up with particular interesting things like the green peas, the green, first green pea discover is on the green peas paper. Uh, and then provide opportunities for further exploration. Make sure that people have this opportunity to go further because that's really what draws people in. So another example uh, that was that, so once Galaxy Zoo was so successful, they said, well, we should turn this into a whole uh, universe of different zoos like Galaxy Zoo. And in fact, a Zooniverse. And so Zooniverse is a website which has many, 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 many different uh, projects on which, in which you can get be get interested and uh, contribute to science. Uh, there's Planet Hunters, for example, which is looking at the light curves, the uh, light output versus time of stars, looking for transits where there's a sudden dip in the amount of light. As a planet goes in front of the star, blocks out some of the light, boom, there's a dip. And turns out, well, computers are actually pretty good at this, but they're not good at it when there's, say, multiple planets going around, or there's a star which is a variable star, and on top of that comes a transit. And so this is data from the Kepler uh, mission, which is uh, basically staring at a patch of stars, a couple hundred thousand stars continuously, and just giving the brightness as a function of time every five minutes or so. Uh, and then you look for transits, and it's found thousands of planets. And some of them have been found by the 
citizen scientists. In fact, some very interesting systems have been found. Here are the transits that were found. And this is a very peculiar one. It was the very first planet orbiting a double uh, star. So this is the uh, one that they've uh, called Tatooine, for obvious reasons. Uh, and basically, there's a double star, and actually not one, but two planets uh, going around it. Uh, and it's, it's a really interesting thing. It's the first time anybody had ever discovered. Uh, and in fact, the uh, Kepler scientists had not really been looking for this type of object because they figured the conventional wisdom that multiple star systems would have unstable planet forming zones because you've got a constantly changing uh, gravitational field and that would churn out and throw away all the material that could otherwise form planets. Well, it turns out that's not true. Uh, it turns out you can actually form uh, planets and we've seen them thanks in part to the citizen scientists. So here's just an uh, example of some of the projects. There's the ORCID uh, project, and one called Ancient Lives that's looking at uh, ancient Greek papyri. There's Old Weather that's looking at weather logs on ships and transcribing them. Planet Hunters, the Milky Way project, which is looking for star formation in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, there's a whales as individuals looking at the different whale songs and uh, trying to identify them. There's the Wildebeest Watch, uh, Cell Slider, which is the Cancer Biology Project, Snapshot Serengeti, where they have hundreds of uh, cameras, thousands of cameras placed in the Serengeti, and they're trying to capture pictures of uh, the numbers of animals so they can sort of get a sense of how many animals are in different areas and what types of animals there are and so what the migration patterns are. So there's a tremendous variety of different projects. Uh, in fact, let's see. Uh, last count, there were 33. It's actually much more than that. This was about a year ago. So there's somewhere around 50 different projects. So, all right. And so here is just sort of some statistics to convince you that indeed uh, there are, you know, quite a bunch of public published papers, many, many, many pieces of data, uh, 200 project scientists. And at last count, let's say they used to keep track of how many volunteers they had by comparing them to the standing armies of different uh, countries. And I think they're not quite yet up to the same count as the number of people in the American standing army, but they're above the standing army of, uh, I think, the European Union, Union combined. Uh, there's uh, a couple million people who are now uh, members of the, the Zooniverse. So, and here's just as a mention, uh, it's not just science, it's also humanities as well. Uh, this is a project where uh, they're, let's see, does the, yeah, there we go, uh, where the project is to transcribe Greek uh, letters on papyri that were found in basically what amounts to a garbage dump in uh, the, they're called the Oxyrhynchus papyri. There are found thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And they're usually just fragments like this, but you know, one fragment, another fragment, before you know it, you've actually got the clues to a book. And they found interesting things in these transcriptions, like portions of lost plays. That we, that's the only thing we have. We have a fragment this large of something that looks like it's a lost play of, you know, one of the important uh, Greek play playwrights. Well, that's sort of intriguing. Uh, So, so, so much for, for, for data. So you've got, that's, that's sort of one way. You can get people engaged in, take, you take your data, you give, them, give it to them in a controlled way, and they'll help you massage it. They'll help you sort of do that first level of analysis, uh, that data reduction. And it, especially if you had a very large data set and, you, and it can't be done on a computer. That's, that's the, the ideal test case in that. But we also wanted to sort of think, that's very sort of, for most, the vast majority of people engaged, that's a very low impact. They might classify a couple dozen uh, things in a day, and then they might come back to it in a month because they put it in their bookmarks, and they might tell a friend. And, but you know, over a period of a year, it's not going to be very much. Now, there's a certain number of them who get uh, completely sucked in and end up doing tens of thousands of galaxies. And there's a little bit of a debate in the community of whether you're taking advantage of these people uh, and you know whether you know, they've been, become addicted to Zooniverse and you, know, you ought to cut them off like a good bartender. Uh, but 
But most people have a very low, uh, low engagement. There are only, only in for dozens of classifications, perhaps. But at least they, they, they now can say that they've participated uh, in a scientific uh, sort of a project. But so we thought about other ways that we could get engaged. And we came up with this other concept, which would be called Far Horizons, uh, which is in for space exploration and engineering, which would have a much closer connection uh, to and pull people in for not just a day, but for weeks, months, years. And it's sort of based on the model. Uh, well, the typical space exploration model is something like Far Horizon, the New Horizons, uh, the recent probe to Pluto. I mean, that was classic uh, traditional research. You've got a very, very expensive probe. Uh, we have individual instruments that are de designed by uh, universities or, uh, or uh, corporations, uh, and everybody who touched this was credentialed, you know, five or six different ways. Uh, you, know, you don't you don't send a spacecraft that costs a billion dollars or five hundred million dollars without being very, very, very careful about it. But what if you don't want to? Be that careful. What if you want to be able to engage lots of people? Well, you can't have a large, uh, a large uh, spacecraft, a large satellite, because they're just expensive. The cost to launch things into space is very, very high. Uh, many thousands of dollars per kilo. So instead, if you look at a much smaller scale, this is something called a CubeSat. It's exactly 10 centimeters on a side. Uh, less than 1.2 uh, kilos. Uh, there's a very specific uh, set of specifications. And if you obey those, they're considered a CubeSat. And there's launching opportunities where you can have a CubeSat like this launched at about the $100,000 level. That's much, much, much more uh, approachable. That's approachable on a single investigator, small grant from the NSF, for example, you know, $400,000, $100,000, which is for uh, cost, uh, launch cost, for example. It's a, the resource level is just right for universities, small companies. High school has launched one. Uh, amateurs have launched small CubeSats, uh, the amateur radio, ham uh, radio community. And the time scale is about right. And it's, you can do this fast because it's not very expensive and it's small. And just, you know, it's, and they're much more single purpose. Yeah, Chris? Hmm? How long did it before it falls back to it? Depends on the or orbit. If it's in a low Earth orbit, sort of around the lines of the International Space Station, then you're talking about two years, something of that order. It depends on whether you're, the, uh, you're in an active solar cycle or a low uh, solar cycle as well. Uh, if it's a higher orbit, say 600 kilometers, it uh, could be a decade or two. So how high does 100,000 uh, Again, it depends. Uh, the, you can get uh, launches for free, too, uh, as secondary payloads if somebody just happens to like you. Uh, there are also programs which are offering free spots. NASA for, offers free, free spots. Uh, but it depends. If you want to go to a geosynchronous orbit or a geosynchronous transfer orbit, that's probably more expensive because those, those slots are more, cost more. But because these things are so small and so low mass, they basically are just in the noise. You know, if you're launching a 5,000 kilo size of a school bus communication satellite, you don't notice if someone is, well, I mean, you do notice, but uh, it's, it's, it doesn't affect your, uh, your fuel margin if someone is also launching a one kilo satellite along with you. But of course, you have to be careful. I mean, you don't want your uh, CubeSat to have a malfunction and blow up and take out a $500 million communication satellite because people get angry at you. Uh, so uh, there's always a but. Uh, you know, I, I talked about this and it sounded very, very attractive. It's very uh, easy, very cheap, and so forth. But you know, there still is a steep inst uh, learning curve, both institutionally and individually. You can't take Joshima Average and sit them down and say, congratulations, you're going to build a satellite for me. Because you, know, you won't get anything. And institutionally, this is still uh, it's a big jump. Uh, it was a big jump for the Adler. And so the way we approached it for, for Horizons is we use ballooning as an on-ramp to space. High altitude ballooning allows you to access near space environments in a sort of mission style uh, where things which are isolated, they're not you know, plugged into the uh, power mains, they're not uh, you know, in a nice cushioned environment, they're subject to the field, they're, there's all sorts of horrible things that can go wrong when you're ballooning. 
Uh, and so that gives you a sort of a test case, a test example. And this is actually the NASA model. Many of the instruments that end up in satellites are first tested on high altitude balloons. <coughs> and if you can show that you're, that for a, you know, you can handle a million dollar grant or two million dollar grant to do an version that goes up in a balloon, then they say, eh, okay, I think we can trust you to uh, be a PI on a, on a major mission. So this is a fairly new uh, program that, that the other's been doing. And the important thing is here is not just that we want to do this, but that we are involving the public actively in space exploration. So not just telling people about it, but they're actually putting hands on helping us uh, design components. And so this is ex uh, a picture of our lab. Uh, at, at, as you can see, it's not very large. It's quite, uh, quite achievable, very uh, easy to do. And we just have volunteers of all different, uh, from all different areas of the world and uh, the, uh, jobs and so forth. We have one person who's, uh, a musician, another person who's the, uh, a C, uh, let's see, a vice president Hertz or something like that. Uh, all sorts of areas. Uh, uh, we've got a couple lawyers, etc., uh, who are interested in, uh, in participating. So, uh, just to reiterate, our costs are uh, for ballooning are a few thousand. Uh, dollars investment and about $500 per mission. Uh, this gets you and about a month of development time and it's sort of much harder to mess up. All right, so this is a typical and uh, launch process. You can see even kids get in, can get involved. So you're really broadening what areas you can do research and who can participate in the process of research. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't let uh, my kids into my lab where I'm doing many different sorts of things, but I would let them help launch balloons. Uh, we go up, we get to about the edge of space, the balloon bursts, and then we come down, hopefully not in the middle of windmill farm as we have occasionally. We've never actually gotten chopped up uh, by one, and we end up in the soybeans or corn. Soybean is much preferable, preferable to corn. Don't ever land in corn if you can avoid it. Uh, yeah, you laugh, it's, 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 it's dreadful because you can't see the payload when it's five feet away from you because the corn is, you know, this high. Yeah. Soybean is wonderful. So, uh, we have done over 100, over 100 flights in this mode uh, with maximum altitude of about 114,000 feet. Uh, we've developed a two-way comm system, web server-based tracker. Uh, so that other people can participate, can follow along, an altitude control system, a ground station to track things, live video feed. You're smiling because you were part of this, uh, Dan. Some sample projects. Uh, we had some high school students who built an ozone monitor, uh, basically uh, measured the ultraviolet flux, uh, narrow band ultraviolet flux at the absorption lines and then just outside the absorption lines, um, measured the column uh, through, through the sun and basically was able to monitor the, the ozone as it went up and then down again. Uh, we've had uh, volunteers building a solar spectrometer uh, to uh, measure uh, spectra of the sun, uh, cosmic ray scintillator panels, and to basically measure cosmic ray rates as a function of altitude. Uh, another vo uh, volunteer is building an inertial measurement unit for us to, so we can track the attitude, what, what direction the payload's pointing. Uh, there's a set of uh, community college students who's work who are working on an imaging system for us, uh, and another volunteer working on battery and power system testing for us. And this is just one, uh, a sample projects. There's many different projects which are currently ongoing uh, that our volunteers are doing. Uh, so we've been pursuing this for about 10 years. Uh, we have a healthy community of students, interns, volunteers. Uh, it's online and physical community. We, we meet every uh, week on an online uh, Google chat. Uh, and as I said, we've done about 100 missions. And the next step is satellite uh, missions. So we've now gotten, gotten our practice. Uh, we've developed a uh, robust community of, uh, who's, who's comfortable doing this sort of thing. And so now is the next step to do CubeSats. So, just to give you a sense of scale, I mentioned CubeSats before. 
This is a one-to-one -one scale model of a CubeSat. In fact, it's our, uh-oh, I just, Ken is not going to be happy with me. So, I think I broke something. Well, I'll, find, I'll find it. Uh, so, this is a one-to-one -one model of, uh, of our CubeSat currently under design, which I'll tell you in uh, much greater detail. And uh, it's constructed of 3D printed parts, bolted together. It's pretty much exactly what, uh, you can pass it around if people promise to be really careful, uh, what it's going to look like. Uh, the only, if you don't drop it, the only the delicate parts are the antennas. Uh, so there's two different sets of antennas. The long antennas are the common antennas. The short ones are for a tracking experiment that we're doing as part of uh, this mission. Uh, it's really remarkable. They're really hand-sized satellites. You know, you just, it's, and this will do some very interesting stuff. So anyway, here are, the, uh, here are some possibilities that we've discussed. Uh, this isn't even all of them. A uh, light pollution monitor, a transient sky survey, small camera spinning 24-7, looking at the sky, looking for things that go bump in the night. Uh, AGN monitoring, looking at very specific uh, active galactic nuclei looking at the earth shine, the integrated earth shine, that's something that we don't actually have a very good measure of because we don't have anything that takes a look at the whole earth as a single pixel very well. Uh, one that we've played around or thought about in actually some detail, uh, how we would have one of these impact an asteroid. So it's sort of like a cheap, uh, a deep impact, the deep impact mission, but much, much cheaper. We call it cheap impact. So what I'm going to tell you about in the remaining time uh, is our light pollution monitor, which is the satellite that is being passed around. Uh-oh, did another one break off? Uh, that's all right. They're designed to yeah, just yeah, put in the box there, thanks. So uh, light pollution. You know, why would we invest our time in building a satellite to monitor uh, light pollution? Well, this basically sort of summarizes it. Here's Chicago, you know, Lake Michigan. It's just a blaze with light. You can see all of the, I mean, basically, if you knew the ge uh, geography of the area, I mean, I think that's Milwaukee up there, you know, and you can sort of just follow down. This is probably I-57. That's probably Kankakee. Uh, you can just sort of list off every city you've ever heard of. Every tiny little town is a blaze of light. Uh, I could go on forever on why, I mean, I'm, I'm an astronomer, right? Uh, why light pollution is an awful thing. Uh, there's negative impacts on astronomy research. There's the loss of the night sky and a public disconnect with, uh, with, with science. There's the loss of celestial cultural heritage. Uh, people barely know what the Big Dipper is, much less all of the wonderful stories of the other stars. Uh, inefficient, when you're shooting half your light upwards, that's a stupid thing to do by anybody's measure because it's just totally wasted. And, uh, we get emotional about these things. Uh, adverse effect on natural systems. Uh, it's not a good thing for animals to be going around constantly in the light. I mean, if you're, if you're a prey and it's always light, it's easier for the predators to eat you. Generally not a good idea. Uh, health, there's possible adverse effects on human health. Uh, it's even been linked to cancer in various types uh, because of the disruption of circadian rhythms. For, despite all of these negative things, including a significant impact, economic impact, there really isn't a whole lot of good data on uh, light pollution. Basically, the operational line scan system uh, sensor, which is on the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, is for a long time the best uh, information we had. And this was just sort of by accident. I mean, I think it was basically designed to be looking for people launching nuclear uh, top missiles or something like that, and they happen to say, oh, we can declassify some of this uh, for people to, uh, but it has a poor resolution, the detection limit isn't bad, though. Uh, then, relatively recently, uh, VIRS was uh, launched, or the instrument was launched on, on SWOMI, and that has a better resolution and much better sensitivity, but these are all things that were not des necessarily designed specifically to look for light pollution. Uh, there was a proposed uh, satellite, which never got launched. Uh, they take pictures in the International Space Station, Space Station, but it's sort of random and ad hoc. And so we decided we could do better uh, as Far Horizons with this sort of community of citizen scientists building things. And that we would 
build sign called Nightsat. And so if you see the thing that's being passed around, you'll see Nightsat emblazoned on the side of one of the solar panels. Those are fake solar panels, uh, but you know, it's also 3D printed so far. So uh, we would better the resolution by more than a factor of three. Instead of having only a single band of uh, color, uh, we would actually have it multispectral. We'd have an RGB channel so we can actually uh, look at the different kinds of light. The sensitivity wouldn't quite compare uh, with yours, but it wouldn't be half bad. It would compare well with that proposed satellite. Instead of always coming over at exactly the same time, uh, 1.30 a.m. local time, which is when Virus always overpasses uh, things because it's in a sun-synchronous orbit, by 1.30, lots of lights have been turned off. So it's not a really good measure of the light pollution. Whereas if you come over all different kind of times of day, that's excellent. You start measuring light pollution at different times. Uh, and then we're going to do a, a program of ground calibration because we have access to many, many, many people through the Adler Planetarium. And we can say, hey, there'll be an overpass at such and such time. Can you guys measure the light that you see on the ground? And then we can correlate it and compare it to the, uh, what the satellite sees. So you can have a ground calibration. Instead of having global coverage, unfortunately, uh, our, our data link, downlink speeds are going to limit us to only 1,000 kilometer by 1,000 kilometer square centered around the Adler Planetarium. Or, well, roughly, say Chicago. So, roughly like that. We might shift it down a little bit to get rid of the uninteresting Canada and get more of this wonderful uh, place down here. I hope there are no Canadians in the audience. Uh, this is an example of what the images will look like. Uh, you can see the color information buys you a lot. You can really tell the different kinds of uh, lighting, for example, in Chicago versus some of these other communities here. Uh, this is a Vera's image. It's a little bit burnt out. Uh, they have a very high dynamic range, and my computer screen does not have a high dynamic range. Uh, but you can see the effects of the fact that it's only one color and the effects of the fact that the resolution isn't as good. Uh, we, we will be a lot better in many different ways than, uh, than, than Vera's will, but not as sensitive. All right, so the, uh, the mission objectives acquire high quality data of regional light pollution, organize the synchronized ground observations, raise awareness, encourage activism, provide authentic science and engineering. Remember, this is about citizen discovery. This is very critical. And do this all with a community of volunteers and students. So a community that's not just, it's, we've started out local, but we're, uh, we're developing that community uh, globally. Uh, we just actually had uh, some contacts with Microsoft who are interested in this model, and they're thinking about trying to bring this to 100 schools around the world. Uh, and so that's, that's our opportunity to, uh, to, to expand much beyond just the United States. So uh, if you've been looking at the CubeSat, you'll see that it looks uh, similar to this. This is a uh, skeletonized version of it without the solar cells, composed of a, uh, the camera, the the attitude control system, uh, the, the flight computer, the, uh, the power system, and the, and the comm system, all in different boards across. So they're all very achievable. Uh, the imager is being developed by the same folks who have been developing the imager for us, our balloon payload. Uh, and so, in fact, I was just working with them yesterday, and uh, they had, not yesterday, sorry, uh, Friday, last day I was in work. Uh, and they're developing a system based on consumer, electron, uh, consumer lens, lensation, uh, PCO edge. This is a, uh, not quite a consumer grade. It's a little bit uh, better than that, uh, but fairly standard camera system uh, designed for low, low light sensitivity. It'll reach the imaging performance that we laid out. It'll have a large field of view a good plate scale uh, so that we can get that resolution that we need uh, for short exposure times uh, and, and good sensitivity, fitting our design. We'll have overpass at all sorts of different times of day, so we're not just limited to 1.30 in, uh, in, the, in the morning, uh, so that's really, really, really nice. And we will cover, as promised, the 1,000 by 1,000 kilometer area centered on Chicago. Uh, roughly speaking, on a one-month time scale. So every month we'll have a measurement of how, uh, of how much light there is in Chicago and in the Chicago environs. Uh, so this, this is really exciting that, that this level of effort can get, because this is, 
what this sort of thing, I mean, this will be the best data set for light pollution uh, that's ever been recorded. So I mean, it's very cutting edge. We've talked to uh, the, the leaders in the field, and they're all like, wow, really? You know, can you get one around my city as well? So I mean, that's the only trouble that's not global. So we're hoping that this will become a, uh, a prototype for multiple satellites. Yeah, Chris? How do you deal with systematic effects such as Christmas lights? Christmas lights. Well, you keep measuring it. You'll have, uh, so you know, you're going to have a, a December measurement, and you'll have a January measurement, and, and so, uh, and then we'll have the next year. And so you, we should be able to see Christ the Christmas peak. Uh, and since we'll also have uh, a variety of times of day, we can also see whether people, for example, turn off their Christmas lights or whether they leave them on. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I don't know. Christmas lights look very like there's lots of them, but they, the sum total light might not be that much. They might change the color uh, the, that you have, especially if there's a lot of colored lights. Uh, it's plausible. Uh, I mean, there are some houses that you probably can see from orbit directly, uh, but, but yeah. Where were we? Here we go. Uh, but yeah, we'll have a lot of different times of day as well, and so we'll be able to uh, look at when, when it's bright. Uh, but that's actually an interesting thing, because we, we don't want to get rid of that. We want to measure that effect, the Christmas light effect. Uh, so uh, comm system, again, we have, someone who, uh, we have several someones who have been working on the comm system for our balloons, and now that they've been with us for a few years working on things, uh, some have been sort of long-term steady folks. Other people came and uh, have come and gone. I think there were there some. Dan, did you work on comm system? I helped you guys when, you, when I was there that summer. Yeah. Years ago, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have interns who come and go, and we also have people who are uh, there for longer periods. Uh, so they're developing a comm system that's based loosely on the ones uh, that we have used in the balloons, the ground station is actually the same ground station as uh, we now can use for, for our balloons. Uh, it's basically just ham radio equipment. A standard ham radio equipment is easily capable of getting what we need, and uh, then doing uh, bandwidth studies to show that the data, the onboard data storage, uh, when we have imaging runs, goes up, and then we have periods where we have no imaging runs and they go down, and, and we zigzag but our com rate down balances what we need. So we're happy about that. We will actually not only be able to take this wonderful data, we'll actually be able to bring it back to the Earth. Uh, useful. I guess in theory it would come back to the Earth anyway when the orbit decays, but uh, they'd be burnt up then. Yeah? We would love a ground station in Australia. Uh, unfortunately, well, first of all, we probably could get ground stations in many, many places uh, because the, the dark sky community is uh, excited about the project. The trouble is that there's various regulations about any data sent down from satellites uh, that are burdensome. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and so maybe we could get away with it if we encrypted everything uh, and didn't allow. You can just put that on the chair or if other people want to see it. Uh, maybe we could get away with, uh, with it if we, you know, hit all the data, but there's, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, if you're taking images in particular, they don't want you to take images of certain areas like North Korea uh, or Israel or, uh, you know, certain military installations in Cuba and uh, so forth, despite the fact that we're only at 200 meter resolution, which... Sorry, can you explain why? Why they don't want? Well, yes. Yes. You're thinking rationally. rationally. But <laughs> uh, uh, you can get, uh, get licenses and so forth, and that's what some of the commercial uh, places do. But actually, uh, many of the commercially available ones uh, started off as European companies uh, because they didn't have these, uh, the, the regulations. And so it's, just, it's been a you know, thorn in the side of... Uh, U.S. imaging, space imaging. You say you need a permit to do this? Spe yeah, special permit. And wow. if you're, well, I think it's, it's either the State Department or the Commerce Department, actually. The one of the things, strangely enough, the uh, National Ocean uh, Oceana Oceanic and Sp Atmospheric Administration, OSA, NOAA, is also involved for some reason in licensing imaging. And so it's, it's, it's a big bureaucracy, but we. Yeah. If 
this was a fully European uh, thing, then yes, they could do it. But if we want to, uh, if it, since it's located in the United States, then no. So I mean, this is actually, you're touching on something that's interesting. There's a lot of space law. And so when I said that there's collaborators of, from all different and people, participants from all areas, walks of life, one thing that we'd like to do is get more people, or, uh, lawyers, who can give us much better advice on this sort of thing and say, oh, here's how you can get around this, or here's what you do, or, and so forth. And so we've actually talked to a few people who are in, interested, and so they'll hopefully come on board soon. But uh, if you're a lawyer, you don't necessarily want to give legal advice outside of the client. Uh, lawyer-client relationship, because then it's, you sort of get liable. Yeah? How do you uh, be sure that all the camera is facing toward the Earth? Ah, excellent. Uh, so that is, huh, it's almost like you are a plant in the audience. That's the attitude control system. This is basically, uh, there are two ways you can do this. You can have a passive system, uh, and that's what we were looking at, where basically you just have a gravity gradient and you're elongated, so you'll naturally uh, orient yourself along the, uh, since the gravity increases towards the Earth. That's not strong enough to be able to get yourself, unless we had a, an, an extended pole that we could extend outwards in both directions, and then we could do that. Uh, but the attitude control system centered in the, uh, in the center has, runs currents around the solar cells and couples that to the magnetic field of the, of the Earth, and so then can sort of tweak and torque the thing. Uh, and I think it may also have some small gyros in it. Uh, we're, we're playing around with two different possibilities, and we'll actively point the telescope always down to what we're looking at. Right, right. Somehow I'm frozen. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess we're stuck here. Let me see what I can get to the next. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Anybody know how to fi fix this? Yeah, let me try that. Mm -hmm. You know what? If all else fails. Okay. I think I'm going to have to reboot. I'll have to do a song and dance. Okay. All right. So, if other people have questions while this uh, piece of hardware reboots, uh, so the cost of the satellite, the actual components will be somewhere on the order of 75k uh, for a single one. We'll probably want an engineering model, so that's about 150k. Launch costs will probably be about 100k, and then there's other costs. But the sort of all sum in hardware costs are somewhere on the order of quarter million dollars at most. Yeah. Just following up on that, the last slide, at least for me, I, I'm still not sure how you know where Earth is. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. And if. Actually... How do you know where Earth is in this model? The main camera is here points towards the Earth. You'll notice that there are two green things. No, when, you first get up. when you first get up, these side cameras will, uh, are star trackers. Uh -huh. So they look at the stars. And with two star trackers, you can get, a, well, actually, even one is enough. Uh, you can get a full uh, knowledge of your orientation. And then you also will have a, uh, a GPS system. You can get space rated GPS ones and still be below the GPS satellites. Uh, we'll have position. Uh, and then we'll be able to orient and make sure that when we first come around for a pass uh, through our... Uh, so then how, now how do you move? 
how do you move is that you have uh, current loops on the corners here. And by pulsing power through the current loops, you produce a magnetic field, which can couple to the Earth's magnetic field and give you a torque. You can only torque, uh, let's see, you know, crosswise to the magnetic field. And so you can, uh, but, that, but since the magnetic field direction keeps changing, you can sort of use that as you go through to, uh, to direct yourself. Uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, just one second. Uh, okay. There. You know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll plug it in as soon as I get things up. Uh, so, uh, how is it delivered to orbit? Uh, basically, just as a ride share with another uh, on another satellite, and so it'll basically share the same sort of orbit. Another possibility is it's launched from the space station, uh, the International Space Station. They'll, you know, basically just toss it out the window. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but. Uh. <laughs> All right. So, exit Dropbox and. Let's see, video, video, where's the video gone? Oh, here it is. All right, hopefully we will be in luck and I can resume my talk after brief technical difficulties. All right, good. Nothing keeps an apple down. There we go. Excellent. OK. So uh, power system, again, being developed by uh, the same, uh, same amateurs who are uh, were volunteers who are working on our power system uh, currently. Uh, basically, uh, if you see the, the model, there will be a series of solar cells. And we basically need just, a, uh, on average, over the orbit, less than a watt. And so there's plenty of power uh, available. So what are the fundamental takeaways that we get from, uh, get from this experience, that, that what we've built so far? Uh, your project has to be science and engineering driven. Uh, you know, when we would sort of stray from that and sort of start doing projects which were just purely sort of based on educational things uh, or saying, you know, help us, help us with our camp design, uh, you know, and some project for, uh, for our summer camps. People just weren't that interested. They're like, oh, that's, a, that, that's good, and you know, it's, it's a worthy thing, uh, but that just wasn't their, uh, what, the, what was really getting them excited. Uh, you have to have bite-sized chunks. You have to you know, break things up. One person will work on at least some subsystem of the, uh, so I mentioned the battery testing, for example. One person is working on battery testing, at a different temperature, different, so forth. Uh, the community development is very important. You can't just sort of say, here's a bunch of stuff, go do it, uh, because people aren't, aren't going to take nicely to that. They'll, uh, they they want to be part of a community. That's what motivates them. You, this gentle on-ramp of ballooning is absolutely vitally important. Get people hooked on the sign that where they can have immediate gratification in a month. They've got sign that's flying, uh, getting images, getting taking data, whatever it is, and then they'll be hooked for life. Uh, room for all walks of life and contributions from lawyers helping us navigate the bureaucracies uh, to uh, ex-engineers to you know biology students, all sorts of folks uh, doing this, and finally. In summary, uh, since it's sort of getting to be about that time, uh, citizen science in general, so now to summarize both things, the Zooniverse and our, uh, and our Far Horizons experience, is getting to be more powerful. We really can. We're, we're seeing sort of the light at the end of the tunnel for, uh, for Far Horizons. We're really about to, be, uh, to launch what's the world's leading light pollution investigations. Uh, and some of, uh, some of the projects that Zooniverse has been involved in, are, again, have been leading. Uh, from science, the sciences to the humanities, uh, this is very, a very powerful tool. And if you've got a large data set that you want to analyze that, uh, that only a graduate student can do, you know, basically only a set of eyes can do, uh, you might be interested in testing, trying out Zooniverse. It's got a, they have a new tool which allows individuals to build their own zoos. 
Uh, it's been sort of designed so it's you know, click in place and drop in place uh, so that you can build your own zoo without having to have uh, software engineers do it for you. It takes very high levels of engagement to uh, continue a project like this. Uh, less so for the, just the plain uh, Zooniverse sort of data analysis ones, uh, but, but even so, the motivations of volunteers are subtle. You make a small change, you think it's no big deal, and you'll hear from your volunteers. You, Why did you take that link away? I was really excited about that. And you'll, you'll instantly have a little storm in a teapot. Uh, the results are sometimes surprising. The green peas took people completely by surprise. Uh, there are some similar examples in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the Planet Hunters the, uh, project. Uh, you've got to provide opportunities for intellectual growth. Uh, you can't just sort of say, here, just do this forever. Uh, it's an excellent opportunity to mix science and outreach. And if you're looking at these things, you might think that, well, actually this isn't, I've been saying this is a new mode, but in some ways, you know, you have to do this with students. Uh, and so, to remind myself of that, I figured I'd end uh, with this. Uh, that while the citizen discovery projects like Zooniverse and Far Horizons are very novel, they're doing new interesting things that, uh, that and in ways that haven't been done before, uh, there's, there are a lot of parallels. Uh, you know, you can't just sort of treat graduate students as replaceable cogs that, you know, will do whatever you want. Uh, you have to mentor them and slowly bring them along. Uh, same thing with citizen scientists. It's just in a, in a different, different sort of way. So, amen. That is all for today, and but uh, happy to take questions.